Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Spin It Social Hour. On a rainy day here in northern New Jersey, uh, I think it's raining mostly on the East Coast here, but it's a wonder, It's a pleasure to be here with everybody this morning. My name is Stefan Kaplan. I am the founder of the Spin It Social Hour, and it. Uh, I am a social media and visual strategist who started this labor of love when the pandemic hit. Because I am here week after week. This is show number 35 um, and counting uh, to bring you the best of the best of photography and storytelling from around the world. I have sought out photographers uh, from New York to abroad that basically are here to uh, show you their work, tell you about their journeys. And my goal is to get their name and everything out there for them more because let's face facts when this pandemic hit it it's really taken its toll economically on uh, many people uh, especially uh, the photography industry and uh, it is my duty and I wanted to help so I am a social media and visual strategist my brand is spin it social I've worked with the likes of the Pulitzer Prizes AARP Jackson Charitable Foundation. I've lectured and I've done workshops at Princeton University, Columbia, NYU, and I'm also an adjunct professor at FIT. This morning, it does it does a hard good to bring on this photographer. Richard Sandler is an amazing, amazing individual. He's one of the legendary street photographers, and he was one of my first teachers that I ever took a course with back in the days at ICP, one of only three. And he set the fire in certain ways, him and Alan Frame. Um, and I l fell in love with photographing the streets many years ago. And Richard is a master at that. So we are here to pay him the respect that he's due and also let him tell his story and have a lot of great fun and a great discussion with him this morning. The buildup that he deserves is right here. Street photography is a wonderful endeavor because you're looking for things that are actually going on, but at the same time, there's that frame. That arrangement of shape just formally is in itself so compelling, says award-winning street photographer and documentary filmmaker Richard Sandler. Sandler's photographs are in the permanent collections of museums and libraries around the U.S. While living in Boston as a macrobiotic chef, Sandler boarded at the house of David McClellan, noted psychologist and Harvard professor. McClellan's wife, Mary, gave Sandler her Leica and taught him how to develop film. Upon seeing his first images, she declared him a photographer. Sandler returned to New York in the 80s, shooting four to five rolls of film a day. He documented, documented the devastating effects of crack and crime in densely populated urban spaces. He stopped around 9-11, but it wasn't for another 15 years that his photographs were collected in a book, The Eyes of the City. He explains that the title means that it's not only he who is in the eyes of the city, who is the eyes of the city, but also the people looking at him. Its publication marked his leaving the city again, this time for Catskill, New York. My life's work, Sanders says, has been a progression from cultural critique to asking more questions, deeper questions about culture itself, and that inevitably leads to questioning colonialism, capitalism, racism, sexism, classism, and all those ugly isms. Folks, it does me so much good, like I said, to bring on great Richard Sandler. Richard, how are you? Hey, hey. All right. Can you hear me all right? I can. How's it all going, right. man? Pretty good, pretty good. Uh, welcome from uh, glorious downtown uh, Catskill, New York. Uh, okay. Right on the Hudson River. <laughs> and between the Catskill Creek. And the Catskill Creek. I live, we live on an isthmus here, sort of. Okay, okay. Very uh, surrounded by water. It's a, it's, a, uh, it's a very spiritual place, actually. The vibe is, uh, is very, very strong here. I've been up there, and the vibe is strong, and yeah. it's a whole place. Um, and I have to tell you, wow, everybody's chiming in already. Uh, Therese Brown from the UK. Hello, Therese. Wonderful to see you here. Let's see some of the other shout-outs. Claudia Paul from Harlem. Uh, Daniel Glickman from StreamYard. Yes, yeah, StreamYard right here, baby. Got my coffee cup. StreamYard swag. Uh, the platform that I do this on. Uh, Corinne from California. Marge from Brooklyn. <laughs> 
and the list goes on and on. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Please share this broadcast with all of your friends and all of your family and everyone so that everyone knows about Richard and his incredible body of work. Richard, going through the work this week with you was like a, like a time warp. It was a throwback to my childhood. It was a throwback to New York City of, its, of, it, of the days when, as everybody used to say, it was the greatest show on earth. <laughs> so tell us, you know, tell us how, tell us how, the, how the fire got lit, how everything got started, you know, in a great sort of, you know, brief way that we can uh, move on to the body of work. But give us the story, Rich. Well, uh, the, the, the story is that uh, I got bit very hard uh, by uh, photography. Uh, prior to photography, I had been doing um, a number of things that were basically uh, uh, directed in, in the helping of other people, uh, uh, as in being a, a chef in uh, one of the you know, first natural foods restaurants in the United States, mm -hmm. and then later as an acupuncturist. So after about eight years of, of that life, uh, I, um, uh, I, I got the bug to uh, uh, do something uh, for myself, something uh, quote unquote selfish, because what I'd doing previously, I guess, wasn't selfish. At least it wasn't aligned that way. And so uh, now I could be uh, free. I could be a photographer. I could roam the streets. And um, I always wanted to be a photographer, but I was intimidated by the... Um, you know, the, the machine aspect of working the camera, like a lot of people. And, uh, but I finally conquered that. And when I did, uh, it was a great freedom to uh, just walk around the street and start taking pictures. And I knew from the moment that I got the camera in my hands, right. Uh, a Minolta SRT 101 with a 55 millimeter lens on it. Mm -hmm. I knew immediately that all I wanted to do was shoot on the street. But let me ask you one question, because the thing that, you know, through our discussion this week and prepping for the show and really learning even more about history about you than I even I knew, and I knew quite a bit, was I'm going to ask you straight off that. Can you tell us more about your experiences in Boston? Because I, we found it fascinating with David and Mary McClellan, how you got your first camera. Well, um, actually, that wasn't my that she gave me my second camera. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, second yeah. Camera. Um, but. Uh, uh, my experience in Boston with them was that I was very fortunate to live in their house in the first place. Sure. Uh, they lived in a, in a huge, uh, like eight bedroom house on the top of hangman's Hill in, in Cambridge mass, the only hill in the town. Uh, and uh, they were uh, very uh, supportive people and they had raised five kids in their house and the kids were gone and uh, they decided to make their house into a working commune of people who were rather motivated to achieve, more than rather motivated to achieve. David's work was all about achievement uh, in the sense of becoming who you really are, what, you know, and, you know uh, 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 figuring out what your talents actually are and then becoming that. Right. And so we who lived there with him and would joke even with him that we were his lab rats, that, that this house full of people, uh, one of them is, uh, uh, was, uh, uh, you know, became the psychology, uh, uh column, uh, uh, for the, uh, wrote for the New York times. The New York times. And, yeah. And, um, so, uh, anyway, it was a wonderful environment in which to, um, incubate another, lifestyle, uh, another way of looking at my life and looking now at the world uh, and trying to deepen my experience as a human being, you know, I guess you say, I could say. So they gave me that opportunity and um, I really ran with it. Uh, the dark room was in the basement. It was Mary's dark room. She taught me how to develop uh, film and print. Right. Uh, and uh, then I was uh, very fortunate because I was also able to sit in on a class at Harvard at the time, taught by the great Ben Lifson, who was the uh, at one time the uh, photo critic uh, mm -hmm. for the Village Voice. Mm -hmm. Very cool guy. And that's where I first heard the names Robert Frank, Gary Winogrand, Andre Cortez, wow. Bill Grant, 
Yeah. Robert Frank, yeah. So anyway, well, normally I ask people who are the photographers that influenced them. I guess I don't need to do that. You just write off the list. <laughs> well, anyway, uh, so I sat in on that class, and uh, I, 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 my mind just was blown. It was a street photography class, and um, I just hit the streets and started. And then at the end of the class, at the end of the semester. He said, uh, Gary Winogrand's coming to town. Uh, some of you might want to take a workshop with him. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I did. Mm-hmm. And uh, then that was quite a, quite a weekend. We're hanging out with Winogrand and, uh, uh, you know, hearing him uh, discourse on photography, which was uh, mind, mind-bogglingly uh, smart and, and, um, and, and succinct about expressing the ideas of photography. Street photography, particularly. Mm-hmm. So you know, within within six months, I I had a place to live with a dark room. I had people to mentor me. Right. I had a Leica, which Mary gave me. Right. Hey, Richard, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. But, um, uh, the camera. It, with, uh, you need to just look a little more towards yeah. the center, towards the camera. There we go. A little more center, and uh, therefore, no, you're you're still a little off. Just turning this. There you go. There you go. Just so yeah. everybody can see your your glasses in that beret. <laughs> so anyway, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Richard. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I apologize. Um, well, I just was fortunate. I walked into I walked into a ready made scene. So right. Uh, I guess uh, I was ready for it, and uh, uh, you know, all things, all the stars aligned. I guess. Yeah. No, they definitely did. Well, you know, we put together quite the uh, journey here to go through a lot of things. And, you know, I have to tell you, you know, you talk about getting the bug and uh, hitting the streets and everything else. You know, like I said early on, um, you and Alan Frame at ICP did the same for me, you know, by meeting you guys and by seeing your work early on, you really lit the fire under my butt to hit the streets of New York City. And I'll always be very, very appreciative of that. So... You know, it was a great course. I think the course I took with you was on street photography. What yeah, it was. That was what, what I else could it be? <laughs> what, what year was that? What year was that? Oh God, we we don't want to do that to me. <laughs> um, it was probably around nineteen, maybe ninety five at the most. Okay. Yeah, probably ninety four, ninety five when ICP was up on Museum Mile. And yeah, every- mansion. Yeah. Yeah, that mansion. That's right. I love that old building. Oh, that was a beautiful place. That was a beautiful building, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Now, now you got the camera angle down perfectly, Rich. That's it, right there. Is, uh, are, are we seeing me and Godless there? Uh, yes, yes, we are. Yeah, that's that's David Godless, folks, and his books uh, are out. Uh, the the first one being called Histories Made at Night, his rock and roll pictures. That's right. And then uh, the book uh, Godless Streets. Godless streets. Godless streets. <laughs> wow, unbelievable! But you know, you know, tell us about your love affair with uh, your love with Lycas. Tell us a little about your love with Lycas. Uh, well, I didn't really ever give it any thought, except that that was the right camera for me because uh, many people have had the experience. Obviously, uh, you get it in your hand and you realize this is a very well-made instrument right. that uh, can maximize. Uh, your uh, technical uh, abilities. It makes it very, very simple. And uh, it's a very straight up camera. And the optics are amazing, of course. Right. Uh, and, you know, it has, a, it has a lot of bad karma. Well, I have to tell you. Good karma, you know. I have to yeah. tell you, you know, uh, the way we're going to talk about, you know, a couple of things when we get into some of the pictures. But, you know, always when I did watch you on the streets back in the days and everything, always seeing you operate the, you know, the way you were able to frame pictures, the way you were able to work the streets for all that they were worth. And I say all that they were worth because it was the greatest show on earth. And um, I have to tell you, there was no better place to grow up than New York City in the in the uh, 70s, 80s and 90s, you know. Um, and it was just incredible. But you, I tell you, man, I had to show this photo, Richard, because I know, I know it's, you know, it has nothing to do with, with, uh, what we're talking about here, but you are one cool cat in this photo. I had to show because I just love this photo of you. Please tell us who took it. Uh, the picture was taken by, uh, Alain Coppel. Uh, he lives up here in Catskill. 
he what he captured you man one cool cat as i as, as i always said about you <laughs> uh, he, he lives right across the street from me on main street oh uh, that's wonderful this, that's was, wonderful. this was at a uh, a costume party well you, i i could see you that in I, I see you in that every day because you are that is that is that is you man one cool cat man but uh you know some a couple of other photos that were taken by some colleagues uh you know i wanted to mention since you wanted to give some shout outs here and uh who took this one of you richard uh of uh, f- uh, my friend fritz fred ask you Fred Askew, that's right. Look at yeah. that beautiful, beautiful, beautiful photo, man. Great photo of you there. Yeah, Fritz is really good. You should yeah, follow no. Fritz. I wish I had his Instagram handle, but uh, um, well, we'll we'll throw it up there. Um, right. um, we'll uh, we'll, we'll um, put it in. The, uh, you can put his uh, name in the chat, and uh, and we, I'll find it, and we'll put it up. So right in the private chat there, and then we can take care of that. So, but. Um, I want you to talk about just for a minute also uh, about a photographer that you really think the world of too. And that as many say is, is the man in certain ways. Why don't you go ahead and tell everybody who this is? Uh, That's Jules Allen. And Jules is a very dear friend and Jules is a great photographer. I love his work and I call him my favorite living photographer. Yeah. Jules is, uh, I tell you, man, his work, uh, Amazing. I've never met him. Uh, I always wanted to, but uh, unfortunately we don't meet everybody in life, but um, I've, you know, great work. And of course you're holding your book, which we're going to talk about because Richard packs them in everywhere. This great photo by Grayson Danzig photography, Uh, check out Grayson Danzig. Uh, This was one of Richard's lectures. I wanted to show this because Richard packs them in everywhere they go, everywhere we go, everywhere everybody goes. And he's now here today, and we have incredible live, live viewership today. Um, and uh, but there's also other people involved in putting a great book together. And uh, we have here Regine Montfort. So tell us about Regine. Well, she's the editor of the book, the first book that I made, "The Eyes of the City." Mm-hmm. We did it together, and we had uh, a, a very good uh, experience. And uh, I think uh, we we got a very uh, uh, a, we found a good way through the material. Um, she's a brilliant editor, has great instincts, and uh, so yeah, that was at the opening. Uh, I could see I could see the great relationship you know that you uh, you know working relationship that you guys have uh, in in uh, doing all this together, and you know it takes a village, man. It takes a a small village, but a village to put together a great book. You know, and um, you can see that in Eyes of the City. But we're going to uh, start getting into the into the book here. And man, I have to tell you, this photo. You know, wow! Looking at this, the subways, the the Eyes of the City, they're right there. Talk about the selection of a great of one of the Jesus, how many great photos you've taken to hit the cover of the book and be the iconic photo on the cover of the book. Um. Well, I was on my way uh, to uh, Barron's magazine to deliver uh, photographs. I worked for them as a, a doing, you know, a portraiture. Right. And um, there was this woman standing behind the pole and everybody looking at me. And I just moved right into it and made it rather clear that I was photographing, not by waiting but just by kind of signaling my intention to photograph this right sometimes that's a wonderful thing to do to engage the people in the picture right sometimes it's not and it's hard to know sometimes which way to go but in this case with her eyes uh her face being bisected by the pole Mm -hmm. uh I was just so drawn to that, of course, and everybody's looking at me too. And and also this picture was taken with a 21 millimeter lens. That's not a lens I, I, I usually work with, right. but I had it on the camera that day. So you can see the door on the left is yeah. leaning, leaning off to the left, you know? Right. Yeah, uh, that's, that's distortion from the lens. Right, yeah, I shot with, I shot with an eight. You got me started, actually. Um, 
I, I got started early on with wide, wide angle lenses, 18, 20s. You know, it was great. I, I fell in love with them, man. Once you start taking those photos with those, you know, those wide angle lenses, man, it's hard to go back. <laughs> I generally don't like them, you know, well, extremely wide angle lenses, because then it's about the lens. Hmm. And this one is on the edge of being about the lens. And, right, and, and right. so that, in a way, that's what makes it work. Mm. Now, anything that you push to the extreme but don't go past the extreme right. is interesting, you know, in the composition of a photograph. So right. this picture, just to analyze it for a moment, most of it looks quite normal except that door on the left. Thank you. Know, you. Somebody, somebody just called my attention to something I have to fix. So please go on now about your Instagram handle. I had a typo in it. So please be aware of that, folks. I'm fixing that right now. It's O stop O H. S T O P 1946. There we go. Thank you for calling that out. Appreciate it. We've got, uh, we've got a lot of editors and very attentive people in the audience here, over 50 watching. And, uh, it is awesome. So, but you know, the thing I remember about this photo recently too, Rich is, uh, before the pandemic hit, you had a great, you were great part of a great exhibit at, uh, the museum of the city of New York, one of my favorite museums that I am honored to have work in, in their permanent collection. And I remember we talked about this photo and I was going there and you asked me to grab a photo before it actually went up, uh, before it opened. And I did. And, you know, it's true. You know, the attention to detail that curators give are so is so amazing. And of course that you give and, you know, just catching that gentleman on the left there with his eye and his nose, just about at the edge there is the key to f if you were framing and matting this photo, right? Well, I, I assumed it was a mistake, you know, and, and probably didn't print this picture for, uh, I don't know, six or eight years, maybe. Right, right. Because I, I, I wanted the, the guy's whole face in the picture. Right. And then I lucked out, obviously, because it's cut in the same way that her face is cut. That's right. By the pole, and so it emphasizes that. Now, that was just dumb luck. Right. So, you know, that that does happen. Yeah. Particularly, it tends to happen with the best pictures. <laughs> yeah, no. Oh, you know, there's there's other eyes, you know, watching, shall we say. You know, there's the photo gods that throw you a bone every once in a while. There are. There are. B Mall's watching from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Who else do we have here today? Let's let's make sure that everybody is acknowledged as they come. Karen Suz Zuzman is here. Uh, she's nice enough to put up those photographers. Uh, Jonathan, can we have her back for a second? Um, let's put that back up there. Jules Allen, Fred Askew, Grayson Danzig, and Regina Montfort. Montfort. Let me say it the right way. Anyway, um, wonderful. Thank you so much for contributing to the show that way. But um, let's let's move on here to some other uh, great frames here. Well, actually, this was a great gathering I had to show because one day G. Paul Burnett, the legendary G. Paul Burnett, took this photo of you guys. And just briefly, I mean, we know who's in the center there. Well, not everybody. I shouldn't say that. But Robert Frank there in the middle uh, with his hand up on, on one of the photographers. I'm forgetting his name right here. Um, Jason Eskenazi. Jason Eskenazi, thank you. How could I forget Jason's name? Anyway, what a great moment that you guys get together, your work you did before the pandemic and before Robert's passing, to get everybody together in this wonderful group of, of photographers. And many of them are. <laughs> yeah, Nina Berman, Amy Arbus. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of, lot of, lot of great, a uh, lot of great Jewish photographers in there. <laughs> well, that was the point of it. I know. I'm, show, I'm showing this now. I wanted to uh, lead into that with this uh, happy Purim for this moment here with Robert Frank. Wow, look at that! Look at all the names in here: Sid Kaplan, Ben Lowry, uh, David Carroll, Carrie Barretts, Nancy Cecil, Amy Arbus, Ruben Radding. My God, it just goes on and on and on. You know. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, and I should have noted, Sarah. Uh, what's that? Sarah Krulwich. Yeah, Sarah Krulwich, who I worked with for many, many years. Yeah. Oh, my God, Sarah was such uh, a staff photographer for the New York Times. So amazing. So yeah. amazing. Um, and William Coupon in the back, Mark Bussell. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Jeffrey Marmelstein. And I had and noted. That. And I had noted there's so much research in this show. I had noted uh, who took this photo, and I did not put it on the photo here. 
and I needed to do that. Um, I'm going to have to find the name and make sure I put it in the in the comments for everybody. So, um, Robert, what's that? And Robert, right in the middle. And Robert, right you in know, the middle, with a big smile on his face. So let's move to you know some of the work. We're going to show a lot of work here that is uh, also going into a possible second book, as you said. So let's uh, talk about that, um, and and let's let's go through a bunch of these. Well, this is the this is from the first book. This so. is in the first book, right? Yeah. So we're going to start with the first book here. Yeah. And, um, you know, the World Trade Center. Talk uh, talk for a, a moment about the World Trade Center, uh, Richard. Uh, well, it was always there. Right. And uh, it was um, more beloved than we knew, obviously, okay. uh, for for its absence, which was a, a, at least a, 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 dis, a distance and direction orientation machine you know you took if you saw the world trade center you kind of knew where you were right. so it had a very interesting function uh you know philippe petit walked from one to the other and there's a right. guy who climbed up it i mean you know it just invited uh, interaction you know one way or another it demanded interaction it and did. plus the whole you know, destruction of Lower Manhattan. You know, the Danny Lyon uh, documented that requ that required it. Right. Uh, that that was required for it was uh, you know in itself such a scar on New York uh, that uh, you know it, there was enormous energy in in those structures. I think so. And um, I always had a bad feeling about it, though, in terms of you know the possibility for disaster. So I was always photographing it, always, always, everywhere I went, you know, I, uh, I'd try, if I could, I'd include the World Trade Center in the, in the photograph. And then when I became a videographer, I, I would videotaping it all the time. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, the New York has a, has a, has a deep, dark history, you know, and uh, if you, if you live in a place long enough, you, uh, get to feel the the threads of uh, both its perfections uh, and its flaws. Absolutely. And I was, I mean, that is a great that is a great way of putting it. A great way of putting it. I, I, and I was abs absolutely out to engage both aspects of New York. You know, the New York that's under the surface, literally in the sense of the subway, and under the surface in terms of history uh, of its history. It, right. particularly in the colonial period. Right. Uh, you know, and so, right. You know, eventually it became the pre-colonial period as well. And well, I have to, I have to tell you, looking at this photo here brings me back to the Bowery days because man, people who don't know what the Bowery was like. Wow. Um, I mean, well, I hate to tell you, this is Boston. This is not the Bowery. But you know it's the same situation. But I mean, the reason why you know no, you got me on that one. Okay. <laughs> the reason why you know it's Boston is because these guys who drink uh, are wearing you know sports coats. They're wearing you know they're 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 dressed up to drink. That's Boston for you. That's the yeah. difference. Right there is the snapshot of the difference between Boston and New York. Well, but this was a this was an interesting picture because um, I I had seen that scroll up there. Fuck work. I had right. seen that uh, at least a, a, two weeks ago. And right. this was early in my uh, uh, years as a photographer. This is 1978. So I was keeping a notebook of places that I wanted to go back to uh, to remind myself right. of places where pictures might be taken. And this was one of those places. And amazingly, it came true. You know, I, it's almost as if I, I willed it into existence. But right. uh, hey, I, Richard, when I... Shift over just a bit. Shift over a bit the other way so because I want to show this photo in a certain way. There you go. Go ahead. Go ahead, bud. I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt you. So uh, anyway, uh, this was uh, this was that uh, that that uh, uh, this was Boston. This is Mass Mass Ave in Boston, and. Uh, uh, the guy on the right, his hands look like a surgeon's hands. They're so they they're do. So beautiful. I mean, that, that, yeah. that pinky, that pinky on on the guy, the other guy's thumb, 
right there. I mean, these are the kinds of gifts, that's what I'm talking about, that you get in the best pictures, apparently. Um, and the fact that his, you know, foot touches the bottom of the frame, you know, right. Right. Uh, which has, you know, it has its own emotion. You know, the frame itself, the, you know, the construction, the, the uh, architecture of the frame creates emotion. Right. Particularly when things are on the edge, like that foot there, you know, it's right. like almost imperfect, but it's perfect. And you know what I mean? It just, it just, it just insists upon the, the, the this moment being captured. It does. It does. It now, really you could even make out a crazy case for, you know, images having the, the images themselves having a say in it. You know, it's, it's right. sometimes it's, it's more than meets the eye. Well, more than meets the eye for somebody who put out a book called Eyes of the City is a perfect way of putting it. But, you know, one of the things I want to do, you know, because like I said, putting a book together is such a special thing. And I can hardly wait if you do do the second book. But like I said, it always takes a village. And, you know, I know how beautiful it is to work with editors and do things. So, you know, I wanted I wanted to bring on a friend of yours here to, to talk a little with you. Hello, my dear, from France. Surprise, <laughs> from Paris, or from France, no. I'm sorry. <laughs> Six <laughs> hours in the future. Yes, what, I am. what does the future hold for us? <laughs> well, um, what would I say? I would say um, a wood-burning stove with a nice fire and a in the wood burning stove for all of you there <laughs> and uh and the countryside for a walk before night comes well bonjour Régine. bonjour from france it's a pleasure to be joining as a surprise <laughs> c'est mon plaisir c'est mon plaisir um uh, j'ai fait mes études au lycée français to everybody i did my studies at a lycée français so i wanted to surprise richard with his editor this morning because you know you know me, I have to throw in a surprise here and there, but, and uh, Regine, welcome uh, to the Spinach Social Hour. Thank you very much. So glad to, to be here. Hello, Richard. So good to hello, see you. Hello, great to see you. We have been greatly separated with this pandemic, and now we have, and I wanted to bring, away from ever. Yeah. I wanted to bring a little comfort, a little French comfort here uh, for you. everybody. And, and uh, I saw the photos of you and Regine. And I saw the beauty of the relationship of working together and put and doing this. And I said, you know what? I'm going to contact her right away, tout de suite, as we say. And I'm going to bring her on if she can come on. And here she is. So why don't you guys talk for a few minutes, uh, for example, a little about the book and, and even a couple of photos here. All right. So maybe that, that would be the time to maybe share some spreads that we were particularly fond uh, about, Richard. And, yeah. it's, and it's Regina. It's Regina. Regina. I'm oh, sorry. I, I didn't mean to say Regina. Excuse me. Right. Excuse me. I used to hate. Uh, I used to hate to have that name, but it's actually a pretty good one. <laughs> I have a lot of friends from the lycée days that were named Regine. So sorry. <laughs> anyway, well, no, so I see we have, we have some fun. friends in the audience as well. So hello to the friends in the audience. Absolutely. Hello to everybody from around the world. We have people watching from Paris, South Africa, you name it. Uh, everywhere here. Uh, it, everybody's here. Mark Bussell is here. Oh, thank yeah, you Mark. so much. Wow, nice I'm honored. You. Um, you know, you. former great New York Times photo editor, uh, magazine, and everywhere at the New York Times. Thank you, Mark, for being here. Uh, anyway, uh, let's have you guys talk about this frame since Richard and I pulled a bunch of pictures. Let's have you talk about this first. Richard. Yeah, Richard, sorry. Um, well, uh, this uh, photograph uh, was one that uh, I, it was, you know, something I was always looking for, which, which was uh, the racial disparity in America, mm -hmm. you know, how to photograph that, mm -hmm. how to make pictures that, you know, really make a statement about that without hitting you over the head. Mm -hmm. And I think it, this one really hits the sweet spot. And also, you know, the frame being so um, complete in a way, mm -hmm. uh, you know, gives it, it serves up a, a level of, of beauty that allows you to take the content in a little bit, I think, or at least to make your own projections upon it. You know, it asks more questions than it answers. Mm -hmm. So, that's what I like about this one particularly. Mm -hmm. 
Regine, let me ask you, uh, Regina, in, in, in putting a book together like Eyes of the City and hopefully even a second book, I mean, what, what are some of the things that, you know, as an editor that you're looking for in Richard's photos to bring into, you know, this book in the, in the curated selection that you make? Well, um, to begin with, I knew I would be, um, I would have the, the pleasure and the privilege to work with great photography. And when I first discovered Richard's uh, work, I was just astounded by the richness of the Richard and richness of the frames. Right. Um, and when uh, when the particularity of the lake uh, that I love is because uh, uh, having no mirror, uh, the photographer is really able to anticipate what's about to come in the frame, mm -hmm. and uh, that we we miss a bit with a reflex camera, even that split the. Uh, Sixtieth of a second or little right. moment. So uh, my new was sitting with very rich images and content, and the subject interested me very much. And of course, to work with Richard. So we really wanted to be free at first, uh, and because uh, 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 Richard had had some his work looked at, put together, edited a bit, and it was really we started fresh, and. Um, and uh, the idea was really to to create a to take people on a journey mm -hmm. um and uh, the beginning of a sequence is always the 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 most uh, difficult but we also found that once that was established we could really ride along and we were on that journey and it was really a, an incredible uh, experience to work together with richard and we would get very excited about the juxtapositions and uh, and how images be, uh, were speaking to uh, each other and uh, what it said. So we also made sure not to shy away from any images that may be perceived as uh, disturbing. It was, I think it was good to uh, awake people and uh, uh, show how um, situations uh, coexist. And there is, uh, even through the disparities, there is a, a residual uh, harmony um, and stop me if you disagree, Richard, in what in the <laughs> language I'm, I'm I'm using right now. <laughs> but this is what it what this is what it felt to me, uh, to me that we had this uh, opportunity to bring in all these elements that would conflate in creating this narrative and this really this this journey through the city. Well, that's and what it is. Although, although, and although we have uh, images that are external to New York, right. but they were really part of uh, Richard's journey. So it was very important to bring them as the last image in the book. Right. And in terms of working on the sequence, what's, what we find, and it's valid for almost every book, right. is it's possible to um, reverse the beginning and the end. And at one point we played with that, if you recall, right. Richard. Yeah, that was perfect, actually. Yeah, we moved the end and we brought it to the beginning and we say, no, no, it's going back to the end. So it's, uh, so it's also a, a, um, a, a feeling that it's very solid when we're able to do that, really reverse the, uh, almost uh, the, the script. Um, so we, we worked, it took us a while and we worked with a small laser prints. Okay. Uh, all of the same size, right, which right. really allowed us to focus on content, not being disrupted by different sizes, and um, and uh, created this, uh, as it's called in the French, which I like, the chemin de fer, the railway, the fair, right. the journey, uh, creating a sequence. Right. And uh, we worked really in this uh, old-fashioned uh, way of working on the, the floor, uh, the carpet of, uh, well, the wood floor and carpet in Richard's apartment. <laughs> and later on, and it was very beautiful experience and very, yeah. very, very mellow and freeing and enjoyable. Uh, one has, you know, uh, putting a book together should really be a joy. Well, I and, tell you, you know, I want it. I, I, that is, I could see, you know, I, I really have good... Um, intuition i really understand people well i think and i saw that photo of you two and i i said you know what i i have to have you on you know to say what you just said and talk about this but richard talk about uh some of what regina said about 
you know, bringing in a few photos from other places like New England, that Boston one you got me on. I thought it was the Bowery. God help me. And then uh, this one here, um, talk about that for a minute because you wanted to talk about this photo in particular. Uh, well, uh, pretty much that's what we were, I was going to mention was that this at one point had been the first photograph and for quite a while, actually, I think. Right. We, didn't, we didn't reverse them, I think, until the end. But um, one thing I, I want to uh, reiterate uh, is, is what Regina did, which was make the beginning. So it was basically Regina that threw down the first, I don't know, probably eight or 10 or 15 pictures. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's true. That was the moment that the book uh, was formed. Mm -hmm. and, and basically we were just uh, toying with the Rubik's Cube of the ordering and the juxtaposition based upon the, uh, the beginning that, Re that Regina started. It didn't stay exactly that way, but the point was we saw where we were going, where, where this train was headed. Yes. And, uh, and, that was, and that took all of the pressure off. It made it, it made it very easy. We worked together very, very well, and, and uh, I, I, I'm deep, always in I, you know, have deep gratitude for that because I'd never done a book before, so I didn't realize that you can, you know, begin to set the imprint of the book and then, you know, follow its essence. Mm -hmm. And then the book is making itself. So that's what I think Regina's incredible skill is to, is to coax out what the work wants to be. Let the work speak to you. Right. And now it's uh, nebulous. Yeah. It's, it's really about distilling uh, a body of work. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, beginning, the beginning is always tough. It is. Because, because it sets the tone. Right. And if the beginning is successful. We feel it. We yeah. feel it. And we know we are on the right track. And then after that, it's about bringing it all together. And it's a discovery. And at some point, the, the sequence starts to dictate itself. The sequence is trying to tell you what it wants you to do. Right. Um, and we had a lot of images to work with. Um, and, uh, and also, uh, it, there is strong social commentary. And uh, and it was it was special uh, in that way, and also uh, and just rich. Uh, you know, we just didn't. We had so much work to to. Well, to the, the, you know, the thing that always struck me about Richard's photos. I mean, I'm a born and bred New Yorker. I was born and raised in Greenwich Village, um, and Manhattan. And I have to tell you. I rode these trains for years and and ran the streets of New York City as a kid for years, whether it was on my roller skate, skateboard, unicycle, you name it. I was all over the streets. And but the grit, the grit, the true essence of New York City, you know, is masked over by so many people out there. But but this was really New York and he captured it to the T every time he was on the street. I mean, his vision and his way of capturing life on the streets. These days with smartphones and everything else, you know, I mean, you, you, I know Richard, I want to talk to you about smartphones because I know that, you know, you don't get that same reaction these days from people because everybody's heads are buried in their smartphones everywhere they go. Talk about that for a second, Richard. Well, uh, I suppose the overview of the work in terms of uh, our recent past is that this is the last moment before computers and cell phones and the digital, uh, the digital world. Yeah. This is, you know, from 1977 to, you know, 1992, uh, right. basically. Right. The majority of the pictures are. You said it perfectly yesterday. I wrote it down because I couldn't forget this quote, the last gasp of the analog world leading up to the millennia. It's so true. I mean, that is like literally the quote right there. Well, I mean, the millennium was, was sort of a joke, but anyway, yeah, yeah people, it, it was, people were insecure about what it might bring, but there it was, there was the internet right at the millennium. Right. There were cell phones right at the millennium. Right. You know, so it was almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy that, you know, something was going to change in a very huge way, right. very, very quickly. You know, we're still spinning from it. 
Well, I have to tell you, people people who didn't ride the New York City subways back in the days do not understand the experiences that took place on them. Oh, look at all this. Look at all this emotion, all this expression, all exactly. this angst, all exactly. this beauty, you know, that happens from the random accumulation, the layering of different people's lives and, ex- and experiences on planet Earth, spaceship right. Earth, you know? That's right. Uh uh, it's, you know, it was just a remarkable time because there was so much self-expression. Well, what a remarkable photo. You and, and, and so not corporate. Right. I mean, you'd see corporate people get on these trains and they would just hide within themselves. They, they couldn't would. deal with this. They, they couldn't would. deal with this level of unprivileged, uh, l- l- maybe maybe a, a, the, the privilege of expression. They couldn't deal with it. You know, right. it was... But, you know, this picture, it's another one of those ones that, you know, you just get lucky. And, and, you know, if you have your camera, you can, with you all the time, you can make the luck to some extent, uh, just because it happens to everybody. But, you know, this couple having a moment of nose to nose, you know, eyeball to eyeball, you know, they're just looking into each other's soul, you know, as deeply as two people can. And these two dudes on the train are, you know, in shades. They're hiding. You know, they're, they're <laughs> they look like undercover agents. The guy on the right, by the way, it turned out was somebody's physics teacher uh, in Manhattan. He was a physics teacher. The guy on the right, he was ID. Um, well, I tell you, they could have been any two detectives, really, too. They <laughs> real undercover detectives because they're um, they're right out of an old school New York City detectives movie, you know. This so is another know. one. This is another one that I didn't print for a long time because I I you know I approached this with you know I was really looking for pictures that were perfect in every way. Right. And and um, I did this one is imperfect in the sense that that's Daryl Strawberry up there on the top on the left on that uh, right a, a glass of milk. It, it, it says milk there actually is cut off. And I really wanted that in the picture, but in in my haste, I, I I framed it improperly. But it works fine because you never know that, and it and I realize I have to see it from the viewer's point of view, not from my point of view. But right. and, but that was a helpful way for me personally to edit my work, which was to go through the first uh, bunch of pictures for the first book in a way where there were no loose. I, I tried to find pictures that had you know very few loose ends. Uh, in a compositional sense, right. just for the purpose of, you know, supporting the content. Right. Um, well, you know, one of the things we wanted to do when you and I were working on putting this show together to, uh, you know, the the body of work that we're going to show even more of, uh, the first book, the second book, we picked some from the first book. We had a great slideshow at the beginning, and now we're going to get into other things. Uh, hold on. Edward Leskin says, imagine the contrast with today with everyone wearing masks, Richard. I am sure you are drawing contrast now and then when you look back at your images. Please share your thoughts on times past and what we have today. Well, we're living in a time of penance, you know, where it's uh, we're paying for the sins of the fathers, you know, shall we say, you know. Uh <laughs> This uh, destruction of the environment that uh, looses viruses onto the world, of the ecosystems being torn down everywhere, uh, is the reason, and we're all to blame. So uh, I, I like this time that we're in right now because it's real. It's more real than anything that's come in, 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 uh, in quite a while. And it's really important for us to begin to ask you know, more structural, even existential questions about how we live. And we're doing that now. And that's yeah. good. That's wonderful. Yeah. And, and certainly, and just, you know, go with it. No, and, 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 you know, this is a good use of fossil fuels right now. You know, this we is, this is inside. what we're doing right now. I don't think that the earth minds the, 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 the use of fossil fuels for this. It does for almost 99% else of the Internet, but not for this. Right. So I thank you, you know, very much really for doing this. This is good. You're bringing us. All together, and uh, you know we're at a in a very uh, difficult time, well, but a very potentially uh, beautiful time. You know, and that we is one of the reasons grow into a greater state of peace right. and respect. You know, for right. the planet and for ourselves and all creatures. So, um, you know, this is uh, this is very this is very good. I, I I choose to look at it very positively. 
Well, and, you know, there, I mean, are, there are positive things. I mean, bringing, bringing all the community together that I'm trying to bring together from the photography world. Regina, <laughs> by the way, your words to me the other day meant the world when you said to me, it's such a wonderful thing that you're doing, bringing the photography community together every week and putting together this work every week. Thank you. Uh, that meant the world to me. And I wanted to say, you know, it, it really is a, a passion, a labor of love of mine to do this after all the years as a photo editor at the Times, as a photojournalist, as a social media guy now, visual, a social media visual strategist. Uh, I work with the Pulitzer Prizes. Uh, I failed to mention that in the beginning. My God, how did I do that? But I cover the Pulitzer Prizes every year um, doing things. But Tell us right here about Richard and Regine. So there's there's two worlds that Richard covered a lot. There's and we talked about this. There's the underground, the subways, and you know the trains. And there's the above ground, the gods of Times Square, all the all the stuff dealing with the streets above ground. Like for instance, here, Richard, you used flash back in the days in a way that very few people did. Talk about that a bit, please. Well, um, uh, New York is dark, and it's uh, difficult to photograph in the winter, right? Um, particularly on dark days, right? Um, you know, uh, the wider the aperture, the the more difficult street photography is, right? So, uh, when I first started photography, my mentors taught me how to use the flash from day one. Mm. So, f literally from the very beginning using the Leica, uh, I was using the flash in 1977. Mm -hmm. And it was very apparent very quickly that that was going to define much of my, you know, work as a photographer mm -hmm. um, because you have such an advantage using the flash on the street uh, in the winter and when it's dark in right. New England. Right. Um, and so uh, it, it, it was used in this case, uh, you know, the, in, in a more quote unquote normal way. The shutter speed is probably, you know, the sync speed of a Leica, which is a 50th of a second. Mm -hmm. But I was extending the shutter speed to a quarter of a second and an eighth of a second and a 15th of a second. And that gives you two images. So you are now layering the flash image on top of the ambient light image right. and uh, creating effects that you didn't see really in the camera. You couldn't see the extension of the, the effect of the extension of the shutter speed. You can't see that. Right. Uh, so it's a surprise. And, uh, you know, it's just somewhat of an exercise in randomness and chance operation, shall we say. And I love that. I love that about it. And uh, so I did that uh, from, from day one. And, uh, you know, came down to New York and started doing it first in Boston and then came down to New York and started, you know, continuing that that in, in Boston. Uh, in New York. Regina, talk talk to us, please, for a moment about about this, you know, using flash versus not using flash, the power of using flash with certain photos and also curating photos in a body of work like this that that bring out certain elements in photos like this and, and the street. Well, the. Um the uh, Richard is very careful. The images that he uses flash with are usually very dramatic. So they punctuate um, the visual uh, through the narrative. As we did with, actually, we used the fact that there were images in the subway and images on the street. So uh, we take the viewer or the reader underground and above ground, underground and above ground. And we had a lot of fun doing this, if you recall, uh, Richard. Uh, that really sort of um, uh, governed a bit uh, the, uh, the pace of, of the book. And, uh, uh, you know, I don't really think so much for me, it's, it's about the resulting image, the complexity uh, and knowing when to use the the flash, and in this case, the flash is very complementary to uh, to to the subject matters, mm -hmm. and it really emphasizes uh, it. It just emphasizes the uh, the dramatic uh, aspect and sometimes the absurd. I mean, we have a whole section here in Times Square which is very wild. Right. Oh yeah, no. Well, and, and, we, and we we wanted also again. It's 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 very important. We can look at an image alone, but the beauty of creating a sequence is we we 
we tell we tell a story of coexistence which is so much right. what new york is right where the you know the the madness of the streets right uh, the uh, particularity i mean the all the uh, different uh, personalities and the uh, layers and um i would say ec- economic layers and and pers- well personalities economics uh all of that i think is infused in uh, in the images that we see um and I, uh, I, I, and, I, I, and in light of the cell phones it's so it was so good to work with so many images where we didn't see cell phones right right no absolutely and, uh, because i think they just kill images and i and i am absolutely allergic uh at uh, entire street photography um today with too many pictures of people looking at their cell phone or holding their cell phone and it's uh, it gets very redundant to me so i think we can really we it's hard to escape that for a photographer yeah. today, but it was a treat not to have to deal with the cell phone element in the, in the <laughs> no i have to tell you it's really true you know going back to bodies of work like this it really does uh, 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 it really struck me about the fact that you know you can't take a picture these days almost without somebody in the background either looking at a phone or or um a, taking a, a selfie of themselves or other photos i mean you know this photo here for instance of grand central you know would have you know there would have been uh, about five to six people at least looking down or looking at a phone these days well and therefore they would not be so present in the moment right right for for the photographer to actually capture right exactly so what, what, what he's saying moments and where they can be because it's the experience and and of course what's beautiful in in Richard's images of portraying uh, people in the street is that he's very quick and so when you have this ability to disappear right um you can you know like this picture in the subway there are all these world the two men are in their own world right. then we can imagine we can have a we can uh, perhaps imagine the dialogue they may have had <laughs> um and uh, and then this couple in the background so it's it's just so rich and and it's an ability uh and and now with the cell phone people people are so involved in in themselves and 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 actually even photographers looking at their screen and their uh all the time miss images because we should be with the camera one with the camera and trusting that and and uh and just be there at, uh recording what's going on and uh and uh, now you see people looking at the photographers looking at the camera and they're they're missing pictures during that right. time it's really i believe it's really very important to be in the moment no oh, it is and that's and why it is mean, fabulous uh, that way it's it's incredible it's uh, it's almost a, a, it's just a, a classic it's one of the first images i saw of richard and the other one is the one at grand central richard where the man is looking and there is the right. clock and and it looks and it's so many worlds are colliding Right. And that's what we find in the record of the city that Richard has given us. Right. Well, that is that is exactly what and it is. Awesome. It, it is a record. It is a historical record of New York City for a, a good many years. And uh, we're indebted to Richard, in my opinion, I am, for doing this work because this photo here, in my opinion, will rank as one of the great photos of all time and and of grand central in particular it is just magnificent i mean it has everything in it and one and uh, we should add that uh, uh, richard is a master printer i have yeah. i have spent years around analog photography right and uh, i have a really great appreciation for uh, the uh, ability uh, to interpret uh, a right. photograph and right. a negative so it excels and that image is taken beyond and to another level right. and uh, uh incredible i mean well, that, uh, that is that is treated differently and uh it wouldn't say the same thing and that's also the beauty of discovering that in a dark room 
No, that is. And Richard, talk about talk about that for a second. Printing uh, these photos and your love of printing, because like Regina said, you know, you do a lot of printing. And one of the things I wanted to quickly mention, we'll be running a banner below. By the way, Regina, we've been showing your Instagram handle and your website on the bottom to make sure everybody can check out your work and learn more about you. Not, Thank you. you know, of course, please. My honor. It's been very quiet on my social media because I've been wanted to be in the present here in my corner of Brittany. Okay. Oh, you're cows and horses and wild birds. And oh, so, wow. well, I've traveled, I've traveled to Brittany. I've been to Concarneau and Benaudet and oh. uh, j'ai mangé les crêpes bretons. Alors, uh, <laughs> I've eaten the, the wonderful crepes in, in Brittany. So, uh, anyway, I wanted to say that Richard, uh, you know, just briefly, you made an incredibly generous offer. I'm running it now that anybody who wants to buy some prints that, you know, they've seen on the show here, uh, limited editions. And if they mention the Spin It Social Hour, that you will generously contribute, you know, 30 percent of the profits to fund the Spin It Social Hour. Um, I have to tell you, um, it, it made me tear up last night and I really appreciate it. It's very generous, but more importantly, let's talk about printing and your love of printing. Well, uh, it's a, it's a wonderful craft to learn and it's a difficult craft. And, uh, I like that about it. Uh, I, um, uh, with computers, you know, it's a, a lot easier mm -hmm. to, uh, exit, uh, exorcise a perfect image right. but um with analog it's it's much more difficult and the beauty of analog printing is that every print is different no matter how much you try to make you know two prints the same there's always going to be slight differences between them also accidents come into into play and you make a print that just for some reason is better than all of the others and that's beautiful so uh you know, it's 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 the part of photography that's like painting in a way. You know, you're painting with light, and uh, interpreting also right. like a like a, a, a you know a, like brushstrokes do. So um, I I just love it. I've never stopped, and I and when digital happened, I I never gravitated towards it in 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 the same way. I did, I never I didn't love it. I think I love it more for, for video and film than I love it for still photography. <clears throat> that is motion film. Mm -hmm. So we're actually looking at the pictures now right. that uh, will be in a second book. Right. So it's, it's pictures from the same era, right. but um, you know, it, it digs at the scab of, of life a little bit more, you know, uh, it gets under the surface, uh, in, in slightly different ways. And, uh, so this is, this will be the work that hopefully Re uh, Regina and I are going to work on, uh, either together <clears throat> or remotely. I don't know. It's possible, I guess, to do a book remote now and we'll do that if we have to, but this, what a world. <laughs> this is the body of work that will form uh, a second book. Uh, and, um, the idea of the book is that I'm, like I said, there's, there's more street karma here, you know? Right, right. More. Well, you know, I wanted to stop on this frame here, Regina and Richard, because um, it's a good moment here to stop for a second. Uh, we have much more to cover and we're not, ch we're not shortchanging Richard's story here. Um, it's the spin it social hour, but the spin it social hour uh, expands when it's needed. <laughs> anyway, uh, this photo here, you know, the gods of Times Square. We know also that you've worked on this incredible amount of, you put a lot of time into uh, filmmaking and you did a production called The Gods of Times Square. This photo here is what I wanted to stop on for a second. And I wanted to show a quick little clip uh, from something here. So give me one second. I'm going to stop sharing the screen. And with the magic of StreamYard, the platform of choice for me, I love StreamYard. Check them out, everybody. StreamYard uh, is the live streaming platform of choice. Uh, love it to death. So we're going to go here and we're going to go to... So, Reverend Billy? Yeah. Yeah. Let me just mute myself for a second. sound put the sound up 
sound up. That's as much as I can get. Okay. <clears throat> Within 21 months, Disney will have purchased, bought out Murdoch, Turner, Gates, Sony, Mitsubishi, and the big German banks. They'll all go the way of the mouse. Mickey Mouse will take over. We will be led into the burning lake of fire, huddling little naked sinners in eternity. And then we'll look up at the mountain above the lake and we'll beg that mountain to throw down its stones and crush us, change our consciousness, because we're so full of regret for having lived such intensely sinful lives. And then we'll look up at that mountain and we'll go, no, no, that can't be. That mountain has big round ears. That mountain is Mickey fucking Mouse. <laughs> you're muted. You're muted. We can hear you, Stephen. Right. Sorry about that. Okay. I'm so la I'm so into that moment that I forgot to unmute myself for a second. But you want to talk about you want to talk about a moment there of Times Square and and the 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 true essence of this of the um, uh, the gods of Times Square. Well, that clip there. Wow, Richard. Talk about talk about the film a bit, Richard. Uh, well, in 1992. Um I started shooting video on the street in New York every day. And I got bit by video every bit as hard as I got bit by still photography. Mm -hmm. uh, at first, I was, I was, you know, uh, it was very unsettling. And I carried my Leicas with me and my video camera on the street um, every day. But uh, after a while, the video became more important to me. Right. And I, and I was surprised that that happened. But it did. And um, so I was shooting video every day on the street, everywhere I went, on the subway, right. in Times Square, uh, uh, literally everywhere I went, I was shooting video. And um, it was like I was, you know, kind of possessed by it, as I had been initially by photography and still was. But video was great because now you can open your ears. You can, you know, sound can carry a picture too. Right. And, uh, my first, uh, my first love of course was, uh, radio, uh, uh, before television and then television. And, um, I, I saw television production as a, as a kid because my godfather, uh, was a, a producer of early television shows. My mother was an actress. She was on TV she was a TV actress. She was a radio actress. She was a stage actress. Um, and so now this, you know, brought me back to my beginning and my first exposures uh, to media itself uh, and felt so at home immediately. I just loved shooting video everywhere and uh, made three documentaries uh, about New York City. This, this one, the clip, is The Gods of Times Square. And that was uh, from shooting video in Times Square every day, more or less every day, and very often every night as well, from 1992 to 1998. And concurrently with that, I was also working in the East Village every day, particularly in the morning and in the evening. And on the way to Times Square and back to the East Village, I was shooting on the subway. And so I made three, three documentaries about New York, The Gods of Times Square, Brave New York, which is a documentary about the East Village shot from 92 to 2004, yeah. catching, you know, the, the really in the teeth of the gentrification of the, of the Lower East Side um, and, the, and the big banks coming in, you know, the things that Reverend Billy was just talking about, you yeah. know. Um, and, uh, and, then on, and then I made a doc called Sway uh, about the subway, and that was from... Uh, 12 years of shooting concurrently with these other two uh, uh, bodies of work. Right. So, 
So um, let, me, let me ask you a quick question. You know, when you started the video, this is the big dilemma sometimes I had whenever I did video because I'm a purist. I love shooting, you know, just straight pictures, but I've also gotten into video quite a bit. Uh, and I love video now. Uh, the power of video, especially in our social media age, too. Sorry, Regina, I'm going to talk a little about social media here, but the, the oh, bottom line. <laughs> <laughs> but the bottom line is with smartphones and social media, that's how I'm making my living these days. And uh, I love I love using I use social media in a very specific way. I'm very, very strategic in how I do social media. But I have to tell you the difference between being able to work with a phone and take pictures these days in video compared to carrying around a video camera like Richard did and also working with a Leica at the same time. Richard, what was your basis? So if you were filming something and yet you really, you know, that moment arrived where, God, you wanted to have your camera in position instead of the video. Did you ever, what was your dilemma with that sometimes? Well, I just want to say before I answer that, this, this picture uh, is, is, you know, squares the circle. This goes back to the beginning because now I'm holding a film camera. That's right. a super eight, you know, film camera right? and, and the Leica. So, uh, and and that that was the next thing that happened. That that video got me into film. Uh, right. Video got me in, video got me into motion picture film, and now I'm as you know as into motion picture film as I was into video. The problem, however, is that it's way more expensive. Right. So that's that's another issue. Right. But, but that um, moment of that moment of deciding still or video the way many people have to do. And I, I I didn't I didn't have the problem actually. Okay. Because okay. I, as far as I know, I was, you know, one of the first digital still users as well because the VX1000, uh, the Sony VX1000, had a still function on it. Right. I'm not talking about taking a frame from video and making a still right. out of it. Right. I'm talking about a still video camera. I'm sorry, a still, a still uh, digital camera was built into a video camera. Right. Separate right. functions. Right. And so I was walking around the streets in, you know, 96, making, you know, uh, making uh, uh, digital stills right. all day long, as well as shooting video. So I didn't have the problem with the VX1000. There was, it was, you know, sometimes I would make a still and sometimes I wouldn't. Uh, I'd sure. keep the video going. Sure. But, you know, generally speaking, it's about sound. Mm -hmm. you know, it's about what somebody or, or is saying or what i'm hearing so uh you know the sound is at least 50 percent of video so uh you know it's a whole different world you know it's apples and oranges comparing still photography to motion with with sound, with or without sound right. you know they're very very different but uh, it was just wonderful to uh, uh be uh to be doing both mm -hmm. and to keep you know enough uh, uh, enough uh, interest and and practice of still photography uh, a, a, a with the camera because I never stopped taking you know uh, stills with with right. the Leica. I always had the Leica with me. And right. there were times when I put it down, but it, I had always came back because still photography is way more difficult than video or filmmaking. I feel. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. It's, I do it's, I do you know it's very much you know it's very much more difficult to to. Right make a really good still photograph. So I always loved the challenge of it. Right. But uh, let me ask you about, you know, your experience as an editor, as somebody who works in the publishing world and everything. What are, what are your views and what are your thoughts about the multimedia culture that we live in these days? Um, well, I think it must be very difficult for, uh, I know photojournalists I am connected with who have to, shoot, carry their laptops so they can transmit images, do video. I mean, I am, I am the type of person, I like to focus on one thing. <laughs> so I'm totally old school like that. So I'd, I think it must be very difficult. Um, mm -hmm. uh, when one can be, uh, uh, personally as a photographer <clears throat> in my days um, behind the lens, I like to really decide of the type of camera I'm going to be working with, whether it's a medium format and knowing, you know, deciding your tool, about uh, deciding what your tools are. And it's so liberating to be able to say, okay, I'm going to be working in that way, in that manner with, uh, let's say, a two and a quarter a camera um, that allows or 
or um, twin lens cameras that allows us to really slow down right. and uh, or uh, decide to work just in Chrome. When I was sent on assignments, I, I refused to shoot both color and black and white for that matter mm -hmm. uh, because we we have to be able to, I think it must be extremely difficult to have to, to see everything, to perceive everything and to really right. feel it in order to translate that I mean, it's really a uh, photograph. It's translating that uh, multi-dimensional reality on a two-dimensional frame. Mm -hmm. That's the way I look at photography, or a two-dimensional plane. So, uh, working with, I mean, doing video and, and, and still, and carrying a laptop, that must be uh, very painful. And oh, for those who do not want to, to uh, to uh, deliver their photographs as quickly, I, I think it's good to to focus on on the. Of course, it may be you know it's comfortable. I mean, I enjoy uh, I enjoy working with the uh, the iPhone to right. take pictures or to do videos or to right. do like one minute videos. But sure. it's just a matter of uh, knowing, let's say, uh, having to split our attention in so many ways. It's right. I find it, ex I'm, I'm a person I like to focus on one thing. If I work on a book, I like to work on one book at a time. Well, Edward, I like Edward, here. a body of work and feel it so I can have dreams about the sequence, wake up and uh, think about uh, having some kind of a revelation about uh, a pairing or, um, and that's beautiful because that's really living in the moment. And, uh, and at my age, that's what I love to do anyway. Well, so that's Edward, you know, Edward, let's, 30 years old. No, thank you so much for that. Uh, that's what I wanted to hear from you, um, is, is what your thoughts, true thoughts are. Uh, put that uh, comment back up from Edward, please, Jonathan. Um, Edward Leskin, one of our big fans and a few, uh, guest in two weeks from now on the Spin It Social Hour, an avid Leica user, is I am a horrible multitasker, he says. I hyper-focus. So for me, I can st only shoot still images. And in fact, a minimum of equipment, anything else distracts me too much. My choice is my Leica M10 and 35 millimeter lens most of the time. Anything more would take me away from pure image making, but that is how my brain is wired. I, I get, uh, yeah, I get it. Uh, it's it's very true. The multitasking that we're under these days is a bit much, even for me sometimes. But, you know, it's the new world we live in, and some of us have to live in it. Others can focus a little more. I know it is a dilemma I face a lot as somebody who loves to do everything uh, in this day and age. But we're going to run through some more photos here in the book, Richard. And uh, why don't you, um, you know, uh, talk about, for instance, some of these, like this classic image here uh, of uh, the old cigar guy here. <laughs> um. <laughs> what a moment. What a moment, man. <laughs> I wasn't shy. No, no, not at all. But, you know, we, we went through some. We're going to go through more here. Um, you know, so many images to show here. Let's run through a bunch as we continue the conversation. Uh, folks, by the way, you're watching the Spin It Social Hour. My name is Stefan Kaplan. I'm the founder of the Spin It Social Hour. And we are now 35 shows in, I'm proud to say, bringing on such great photographers from around the world like Richard Sandler, including editors such as Regina Montfort here, all the way from Bretagne in France, Oh my God! What an honor! I'm so I'm so uh, happy to have you on as well. Uh, it's wonderful. I have, a, I have a I have a love for Brittany like nothing else ever since I visited there. Uh, one of my best friends is from there, Stéphane Le Pichon. <laughs> so uh, his wife was chiming in earlier uh, and saying hello, my friend Rekia. But anyway, um, let's let's go through some of these. Richard, uh, here's another one that could easily fit into the uh, the gods of Times Square, but what was it that you were, you know, when you were working on this also with the still images, what were some of the things that grabbed you the most working on the gods of Times Square? Well, it was about the, uh, the fact that religion, people with religion uh, on their mind would come to Times Square to talk about it. Right. And Times Square had always been a kind of speaker's corner the one spot in New York City where you know you could go and be heard if you had something to say, or if you were interested in just uh, putting your finger 
on the pulse of New York. That's where the pulse of New York is the strongest, is Times Square. Yeah. No, it, it really, really was. It really was an incredible, incredible place to be around. Um, but, you know, then there's the other side of Times Square, you know, that, oh, my God, there were always these incredible moments. You know, there were chess players. There was the craziness of the Port Authority and all the theaters on 49th yeah. Street that were you know, at all. Uh, yeah. yeah. So much going on. So much life. I so mean, in this, case, in this case, you've got a cop dressed as a cop. You've right. got a person dressed as a cop, you know? It's he's a he's obviously a chess player too, and you know that that I'm just the, the level of you know sort of just analog humanity, if such a dumb thing can be said, um, uh, but I, I guess kind of has to be said uh, existed, and uh, this like I say was the last gasp of you know people everybody being literally on the street. There was no place to hide. Right, you were on the street. You couldn't you know be. Uh, on the phone or in, 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 you might have a Walkman on, but you, you were on the street and, you know, it was quite a show. Now that's definitely a guy, I think. No, it is. It is. He's wearing a wig. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you gotta love, you gotta love the taxi drivers from back in the day. Listen, so, so let me, let me explain this. Um, so these pictures that you're seeing now, the vast majority of them, I'm seeing for the first time uh, myself. I printed these in the last four years. I've been in the darkroom a lot. I've been going through all of my work and coming up with a lot of pictures that I had either not seen or overlooked a number of times previously. Right. So, uh, what, a, what a treat to have them on moving. here. Keep moving. Okay, what a treat to have them on here. By the way, hold on one second. I, I have to. I want to bring on Jonathan Borstein, my co-producer, who helps so much every week in putting the show together. I couldn't do it without him. Uh, we're a team, and uh, it's uh, he's a dear friend, and a great, great um, all-around writer um, and uh, New Yorker. So, Jonathan, introduce yourself, please. Uh, I am Jonathan Borstein, a full-time planner, a sometime writer, and part-time tech, and my question is more involved location than photography, uh, because I know that uh, Richard said that he lived in the uh, East Village, uh, Lower East Side for a while, but uh, this morning, Marble Collegiate has all but burnt to the ground. Do you have any wow. memories of the church? The, the church burned? Yeah, last night, yeah. Oh, Second yeah. Avenue and Seventh Street. Horrible fire last night. Horrible. Well, my my my. Oh man, that's terrible. My yeah. my enduring memory will be taping Arlene Gottfried singing gospel in there. Oh man, I have a beautiful tape of Arlene there um, that I shot uh, in in the nineties, like ninety five or ninety six. Oh, that's just terrible. Yeah, that's very sad. So sorry to hear that. Oh, there was a really bad fire on such a good church, such good people. Yeah. There's really they're 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 true Christians in the best sense of the word. Yeah. No, I, I saw some video on it and it was just bad. I hope the firemen, I hope everybody involved are okay. Um it was it was and you could see it for miles. It was really a big fire. So especially right now with the pandemic and everything, just so hard to do everything. The FDNY wire is so incredible uh, 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 at, you know, taking on those blazes. But Jonathan, go ahead. I'm sorry. You were talking about asking Richard a question about well, that. When you answered my question, right. um, there are very even sadder is that I believe there are two deaths, but I'm, that hasn't been fully confirmed yet. Uh. But anyway, on that sad note, I will let the show go on. All right, Jonathan. Thank you for being here. By the way, Jonathan drives the car behind the scenes every week, putting the comments up, taking care of the banners and tickers, and contributing in uh, many other things as we put this show together every week. So thank you so much, Jonathan. All right. We'll see him soon. So we're going to go on, as Richard uh, was urging me to go on, with uh, many more of the photos here as we go through a bunch of these. Uh, Richard, continue talking about this uh, other body of work that you're uh, going through for possibly a second book. Um, 
Well, you know, let's let's just let some play. You know, uh, okay. Just you know, basically, I didn't. This is not in any way edited. Right. I allowed the randomness of uh, right. the algorithms of whatever right. to order them. I didn't play with the order yet. So right. I love that that you. Raw, that you yeah. This is the raw stuff, and uh, this is what's awaiting a sequence. Right. That picture I printed for the first time like two weeks ago. I had never ever. I didn't even know I had it. <laughs> you know, this is like I I, I called this one fur vulva. <laughs> it's, <laughs> oh, okay. it's almost like she's giving birth to herself. It's like <laughs> it's just you know, I mean, and and this one's also got you know the long shutter speed and the flash and the long shutter speed. And I'm, uh, I'm gonna need- I, honestly, I passed over this picture, you know, dozens of times. I'm going to need some water here as we're. Uh, <laughs> Richard and Stephen, I can see this as a transition for the second chapter. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. I think Regina and I are going to have a good time with the with these pictures. Yeah, yeah. No, I feel I feel really good about them. I look at these. I mean, you know, what I'm doing about? this for the first time as well, Stephen. Oh, yeah. look at that. Wow. Yeah. What, a, what, yeah. what a great. Except for, a couple, except for a couple of them that I remember. Folks, uh, if you from, from the past, but uh, all of these uh, uh, new images, some of them I've seen on Instagram, but maybe. So, in, but uh, watching, it's exciting to see them. If you're watching the Spinet Social Hour, which over 40 to 50 people are live right now, which is a great audience and many hundreds of, uh, hundred, oh, so many comments. Uh, do we have any comments we can throw up on the screen that we can share? Uh, mm-hmm. Because so many people have been contributing before we go on here. We want to make sure. Uh, that we acknowledge some other people, but that's a, that's really incredible to hear. I had no idea that you hadn't seen a lot of these, uh, and it's wonderful to have you on as the editor of of Richard's book and working with him hand in hand to go through these. Then with you guys, this is a a real treat. Look at these folks. Um, you know, you're getting a first hand look at at many classic Richard Sandler photos here that will uh, most likely go in a second book that him and Regina will work on together. Um, the mine is already going. Huh? Yeah, no, we, you know, we covered a lot, <laughs> but, you know, we have to, I love this. It's like looking at two beehive hairdos from behind back in the days, man. You can, can take Edward's comment off. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, let's, pat, no, uh, so let's go by that and uh, let's go. Wow. I mean, look at the, look at these as we go through them. And let's hold the comments for now as we go through these photos so nothing is clipped off any of them um, because they're too beautiful to have anything interrupt the beautiful, the beauty of all four corners in these frames. Look at, look at this. This is something out of like a cross between, wow, I don't even know, a <laughs> madman and some, some other moment in uh, in New York City history here. And my friend Jonathan's uncle. I didn't know it when I shot. The really? Picture. Wow! 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 My dear friend Jonathan Scheuer, and that's his uncle. Wow! And the, and beauty, the, <laughs> the beauty of the subways, man. The romance in the subways, and and the the moments on the street with uh, the wonderful immigrant city that it's always been, uh, and uh, and will stay. Uh, we hope. Um, and yes, we do hope we do hope big time. And, um, wow, <laughs> looking at the, this image, man, check her out with a what kind of a cigarette was it's, that? Uh, it was identified as an Eve, an Eve cigarette. An Eve it, cigarette. It, it was not a Virginia Slim, which is what I thought it was. It was an Eve, and these were cigarettes that were marketed, you know, to women, obviously. Wow. Um, and uh, and women smoke them. Wow, unbelievable! But look at this! Look at this! Look at the beauty of this image here. Um, the 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 reality of going to work. The executives back in the days on the streets uh, and hitting the subway. Um, you know, they they were they were real, man. They were real back in the days, man. Um, and uh, there's a photographer there you can identify. I know. That's my friend Bruce Gilden. Yep, let's let's uh, shout out to we're out, out shooting that day together. Yep, 
And, uh, you know, the one thing, man, also back in the days, people reading the tabloids or people reading the newspaper with the bold headlines back there, mystery man, uh, not a bright moment here, but mystery man slays co-ed, a horrible moment. But what what a what a true New York City photo there. Uh, on the, the, guy, the guy has given me the finger. <clears throat> That's right. Look at that. But, I mean, you wouldn't know that. You would know that if it, if it was motion, but but yeah. he's actually raising and lowering his middle finger as I'm photographing him no, through, the window, through the window of the train. I'm in the train, sitting sitting down in the train, and I put the camera up against the glass, and he, yeah. I know that feeling all too, I know that feeling all too well, having been given the finger many times, taking people's pictures on the on yeah. the subways and the streets. We almost put that one in the first book. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's so rich. Nothing is superfluous in the images. You know, yeah. uh, it's. Um... No, they're just, you know, they all, uh, you know, I was looking at this photo, Regina, and in New York City, there's a legendary New York City broadcaster named Tiwa Chang. And um, I, I could swear that's Tiwa Chang. I think Chang. that is him. I could swear that's him. T.Y., yeah, if you're watching this broadcast and that is you, uh, you're a part of the Minute Social Hour with the history of Richard Sandler and the streets of New York City. We know what a great broadcaster you've been over the years. Um, and, um, you know, T.Y. is a, a, a legend in New York, in my opinion, a, a great, great broadcaster uh, for, uh, for the um, – um, sorry um, – if I say eyewitness news and I'm wrong, I'm going to be really embarrassed. <laughs> um, but anyway, let's move on here to the photographs here. Um, wow. I mean, um, you know, it's funny. I look at this photo, Richard, and I took a photo sim uh, in a certain way on the subway about a year ago. And I remember the moment because a woman walked over to the woman I was people I was taking the photograph of. And she said, did you know that this creep was taking your photo? And I looked at her, I said, ma'am, first of all, I'm not a creep. Second of all, I'm a photojournalist. And third of all, um, I'm documenting the streets and the subway the way many people do. But this photo is just another class. Because on my photo, everybody's on their phones. In your photo, everybody's reading. <laughs> yeah. Well, that pretty quickly. Yeah. That change happened awfully fast. You know, we're still spinning. Um, I wanted to mention one thing. Yes. Um, Charles Harbett, uh, who, who was a, a, a very good friend uh, and, and a very brilliant writer, a very brilliant photographer and a very brilliant writer on photography, said one thing that I wanted to uh, uh, quote at, at, at the end of his uh, uh, epilogue to his book called Travelogue. He says, um, I'm paraphrasing a little, but he said, um, if you want to know if a photograph is good, ask yourself uh, if, if, uh, if, if wait a minute. If you if you it, to if you want to know if a photograph is good, ask yourself is life like that? Is life like that? And the answer has to be yes and no, but mostly yes. <laughs> so you know there you you need to have that edge that makes it a photograph which is different than reality right you, know, you take the world and you you know you put a frame around it and uh you know you have different relationships than you have with you know it, with actual seeing right but it's really nice to see these you know in a bunch and i uh you know the more i see them the more i'm now getting you know ideas for you know how to put them together but uh this is very exciting to me. Okay, so that's Robert, and that was that was that Robert and June Leaf, right? His wife, and uh, this was that same day uh, that we were all out there. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, I decided to just you know show the two of them. Yeah, the great the Robert tenderness, the great. you know, the real tenderness there yeah. of you know, the master, the the guy that you know burned down the house for everybody to walk into, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, legendary Robert Frank, yeah. everybody. The legendary so it was, Robert, you know, it was Robert that um, made the first sort of significant tilted picture right. that Gary Winogrand picked up on, and he, and and Winogrand. When I took a workshop, I took a workshop as I mentioned with Winogrand in '77, and he mentioned that picture, the 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 preacher with the cross walking towards a river, and that picture's tilted. 
right. and said he he uh, he advised everybody to just you know tilt pictures because the thing about tilting a picture go back to that that one before the thing about tilting the picture is that the long axis the longest axis obviously of a of a of a rectangle is is the uh, you know the the uh, uh, what's the word the uh, uh, you know, it, it, it's, you know, the edge to edge, lower right to upper, upper lower left to upper right. right. And Diagonal. Diagonal. So if, you know, so you can get more in by tilting the camera, at least on the diagonal, you can get more in than any other place in the frame. And generally speaking, uh, when, uh, uh, when the tilt happens, it's probably because you've gotten a little bit too close. Right. This was at an opening. Sorry, opening. Uh, you know, uh, at uh, one of the galleries. Right. Um, yeah, that's... So this is just, you know, the raw material of uh, of another book. Right. And uh, well, it's, it's really a pleasure. And I am I am honored to have you on the show mm -hmm. to go through this work thank together. You. For many yeah, people, thank you. Thank you. Many I, people I, seeing this for the first time on my yeah. on, the, on the Spin and Social Hours are really yeah. great. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> what what do you think he's thinking here? <laughs> he's had a bad day, probably. He just had a bad day, man. He's had a really rough day. I mean, if you're if you're kissing the pole, yeah, you know, you're really in bad shape. You yeah, know? you're in bad shape, man. You're, I feel for him. I feel for him. You know. Yeah, he could barely keep his head up. That guy. You know, he's working too hard. Yeah, man. And then you have the you know the. Uh, the younger crowd. What a wow. Look at this. Look at this. And this one also, I didn't print until about a month ago. Wow. Yeah. That's beautiful. But I like it. I, I like this one. This one's difficult to print. It, yeah, it seems that way, I bet. Yeah. It's, it's probably three stops underexposed or two, at least two, maybe two and a half stops underexposed. Right. I never made the print, but then, you know. In going through this old work, uh, you know, I've opened myself up a little bit. So uh, that is to say, that's something I wouldn't have, I never printed it in the past, right. but uh, uh, I've been printing things that I had not printed. This one is an old one that's from 1978, and that was also, we considered that one for the first book. Right. Well, this one here really strikes home for me because I grew up in Greenwich Village, as I said. And uh, my mother lived uh, right near, you know, we lived near, uh, uh, right there. She lived in Manetta Lane uh, for a period. Uh, and uh, I have to tell you, you know, this photo here was, wow. I mean, this, photo, I just, oh, man, I could look at this all day, man. The three old dudes just sitting there looking probably at the, what, I forget the name of the park right across the street there. Uh, was it Pompeii Park? Uh, I think it could. I think it is. Yeah. yeah on, Pompeii, on the other side of Sixth Avenue, you mean? Yeah, because Pompeii yeah. Church is the other across the way, yeah. and then the other way is St. Anthony's. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, and yeah, they're looking and, west on yeah, Sixth. Avenue. You know, you can see these guys just walking out uh, just earlier from down the block from Rocco's Pastry Shop, where I used to grab my cannolis and my cappuccino, and you can see them just having that, and then coming over here and sitting down or getting some bread from Zito's. Uh, Zito's bread shop, old man Zito, and they, and the other guy hanging out with them there. What a great photo, man! What a great photo! What a treat! What a treat! Um, okay, so um, she was playing up to the camera here, obviously, <laughs> <laughs> just a bit. And then we have uh, the NYPD on the streets there, and the old school jackets. And uh, New York City was a land of fur coats back then, wasn't it? <laughs> It really was. Yeah. It really was, but yeah. Wow, raw Times Square, man. Raw. Well, Times that's actually Thirty Fourth Street. Thirty Third. Oh, okay. Thirty Third. Thirty Third. Okay. Threw me on that one. Okay. Thirty yeah, Third and Sixth. Okay. Wow, look at these. Absolutely beautiful Washington Square, where I grew up. <laughs> man, I tell you, back in the days, man. And this photo, man, this photo is really something, man. Well, this was this was actually <clears throat> the first one that that I found when I went through the work again for right. the second time, right. starting <clears throat> four and a half years ago. This right. was the first one I found, and I never printed this in the past because I didn't like the 
foot coming out of the woman's chin. Yeah, I could see uh, that. I could see but, that. But now I love it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, it's something, you know, something shifted in me because this really tells the story. <clears throat> Excuse me. One of the scabs I'm definitely picking at is, as I say, the scab of race. Right. You know, and so this one is, I, I like it a lot because it asks a lot of questions, but also formally, formally, it, you know, makes the grade as well. <clears throat> No, it does. But, you know, you have that love-hate relationship with certain frames sometimes, and then you grow to love them. Like Yeah, you said. can't see them. You're not ready to see them sometimes. Right, you're not. You're not. Yeah, so, uh, and, and so this is a picture I took of Gary Winogrand uh, in uh, 19, uh, it's like a Winogrand of a Winogrand, <laughs> a Winogrand of Winogrand, because uh, that woman on the left, <clears throat> uh, the two women on the left particularly, could easily be, be women in Winogrand's body of work you know women are beautiful right um anyway he's holding court obviously and uh right. uh i he he was a great guy i'm so glad i got to meet him and hang out with him a little bit yeah um and then see him over the years every once in a while in new york city a winner grand of a winner grand folks. i just want to i just want to uh uh just recall my last the last time i saw gary Winogrand. Yeah. Sure. Which was uh, on 57th Street between 5th and 6th Avenue in uh, probably late 1983. He died in 1984. Okay. So he's maybe six months uh, uh, from dying. I saw him in, on, on 57th Street and he, was, and he had a Leica with a motor winder <clears throat> on it. Mm. A motor winder, okay. Mm. The master of the decisive moment, really, or one of the masters of the decisive moment, yeah. had a motor winder on his Leica. Wow. <laughs> and I looked at the motor winder like this. <laughs> and Winogrand looks back at me and he goes like this. <laughs> he just shrugs. And that word was said. And he kept, you know, we said hi, you know, from uh, at the start of the, uh, of it, of the meeting. And then he just, you know, walked on. Well, I have to tell you, we've run through pretty much everything, Richard. Uh, uh, I think we're going to bring this to an end. But I wanted to say, you know, what what an honor uh, and uh, so thrilling to have you, one of my mentors on early on in my life in photography, who made me appreciate photography <laughs> so much more. Klaizdina, um, what a beautiful, beautiful thing to be able to bring you on as well, all the way from beautiful. <laughs> And, oh, please, uh, your input was invaluable. And, uh, you know, the beauty of your spirit of working with Richard on this uh, project and projects shines through. And I'm glad we were able to have you uh, talk a lot about different things. So, um, Richard, wow. Um, you Thank know, you. I'm sure everybody's going to check out more and more of your work, those who may be new to it. You know, there's always new people to it. Uh, those who are uh, indebted fans Got to see some real treats today that very few people have seen of your work. New stuff uh, that's going to possibly be in a second book. I'm over the top, uh, you know, wow, about having you on the show to be able to do that. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. No, thank you for working uh, working on me, working on me, working with me this week on the Spin It Social or about that. But um, I'm going to start to close it out. If both of you could just stay there for a moment, I'll be back in a minute. I just wanted to have a word with you, but uh, hold on. I'm going to take this off the screen here so everybody can say goodbye. Uh, but Richard, uh, any last yeah. words to, uh, to uh, the amazing crowd we had today watching? And we had an amazing crowd. Um, no, nothing. Just I'm very, very pleased that you did this. And very, very pleased to see Regina uh, on on the screen, and uh, this is what we got to do right now. And thanks for doing it very much. It's my pleasure. So hold on one moment. I'm going to close it out. Hold on, and hold on, everybody, because I'm going to talk about next week's guest, uh, which is uh, right here. I'm going to throw it up right here. Next week we have Keiko Hiromi 
uh, from Boston. Keiko is a really great photographer from Boston. She's one of the shooting partners of uh, Rick Friedman and uh, one of his main assistants who was a guest last week. I saw Keiko's work, uh, having gone through Richard's, and I'll be honest, I did not know much about her, but I became such a quick fan of her work. I said, you know what? Uh, I have a time slot open next week. Let's bring Keiko on. So Keiko's going to be our guest next week, and I can hardly wait to bring her on. Um, and uh, let me also say that it's been wonderful having a sponsor for this show, Emilio Pardo, who is um, one of uh, somebody I've worked with is a real incredible brand strategist out there. We have a new show called Real Talk Live from the Barn. We've been working on new episodes, but we're, and we're going to have one very soon. So look forward to it. But here's a quick, small uh, intro clip. It's going. It's about all issues COVID. Uh, dealing with the economy, we had uh, Seth Harrison, who may be our next Secretary of Labor. Uh, I hope so. Uh, I think Seth Harris is an amazing individual and a great economist. So check this out real quick. Hi there. Welcome to Real Talk Live at the Barn. All right. New episodes online soon. Uh, we will let you know. Thank you very much for all of that. Uh, I'm also going to quickly tell you about a great new show on Sundays. Uh, it's been on since the pandemic, pretty much. She's on call Sundays at 11 a.m. Uh, an incredible show with Dr. Sujana and Dr. Marina. Uh, every week on Sundays at 11 a.m. talking about all issues COVID. And uh, I have to tell you, folks, it has been uh, an incredible, incredible hour today. So once again, thank you for tuning in to the Spin It Social Hour. And um, a big shout out um, to my uh, colleagues Sri Srinivasan and Neil Parekh with the Sunday NYT Read Along. Um, it is on every Sunday at, um, at 8.30 a.m., uh, hashtag NYT read along. Um, I had a minor snafu with the card this morning. So, uh, but please tune in to Sri's Sunday NYT read along and, uh, we will uh, be part of that every Sunday. So once again, folks, Stefan Kaplan for the spin it social hour. Thank you very much for being here. Check out the spin it social hour on YouTube, all 35 episodes. And next week we bring on the wonderful Keiko Hiromi. All right, folks. Thank you very much. Take care.